Hey, hey, it's me, Jean. And I'm really excited because I'm going to be coming back live on Tuesdays and Thursdays here in the group. And I wanted to connect back with you. And I know we have had um, some new people come in. And they came in by way of the summit that we just recently had and some other ways as, as well. And so I just wanted to kind of reintroduce myself, um, like, like where I came from, where I am, what my background is, and why am I doing this, right? Why am I pulling together this group of moms, dads, grandparents to help their, to motivate their learners, right? So here's kind of a little bit of my story. But before we get started, I want to introduce myself, Jean Harville. And I am the creator of this group, Raising Motivated Learners. And I wanted to bring together uh, moms, dads, grandparents, whomever are the significant people who are taking care of kids, are struggling learners. They could have dyslexia, they have autism, ADHD, or not be identified with anything and just be struggling, right? And so I just wanted to, you know, bring us together so that we can figure out ways that we can support our kids. So I'm gonna give you a three points. I'm gonna introduce who I am, my story, and also um, when I became a teacher and what did I do to help myself in the area that I was struggling with. So here we go. So the first thing is that um, when I was kind of introduced my story back in the day when I was in school, many years ago, it feels like centuries, but not. Um, when I was in school, one of the things that I struggled with was reading comprehension. Being able to read, I was a great reader. I could read perfectly well. I read every word, perfect, on point, even the punctuation marks, everything to the T. But when it came to asking me, and are asking me a question and for me to answer it like what happened in the story or, or a specific detail I had no idea it just went out my, the window it went out the top of my head and just went out and I just had no idea because I was so concentrated on the words and on reading those words perfectly well because I knew all my classmates were listening and I wanted to have a good show of reading right and not struggle through but when it came to asking questions, I just shrunk down in my seat. I'm like, please don't call on me. I mean, I just read the passage, so obviously you're not gonna be calling on me. I felt kind of safe <laughs> that the teacher would not call on me, and she did not. But I really, she was asking questions, and I'm thinking, I really don't know the answer to these questions. I was flipping back through my story and just kind of, just trying to skim it just a little bit so I could maybe have an idea of what the story was about, but I didn't. And this was like in fourth grade when this happened. And when, it, when we started having like standardized testing, like I think at the point, it's, I, elementary went to sixth grade at that point. And at the end of elementary school, we had to do these standardized tests. Well, that was a struggle for me because oftentimes you have to do a lot of reading and then you have to answer questions. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I have to go back. I would read the questions. I'd go back and read the passage. Then I'd read the question. I have to go back and find it in the passage. And it would take me forever to answer those questions. I didn't always get them right. Um, and so what would bother me is I had to have complete silence. So when the other students would finish and they get up and walk past me to turn in their work and they leave and I was like, oh man, I'm behind right and that and it and also bothered me it, it messed you know I wasn't focused anymore because the noise distracted me so it was like that all through school and for me to do an assignment at home I had to have complete silence and I actually read out loud to myself so I could hear myself to read out loud and to keep me focused on what I was reading rereading and rereading and that was just a real struggle for me and I don't think at that time that they had the different testing for different types of, of learners. I think it was mainly for those who were physically disabled or severely impaired or something like that. But it really, I'm not sure that dyslexia was really picked up or not. So I don't know if I had dyslexia or not. All I know is I struggled and I was a struggle learn, struggling learner and I get the feeling of not being enough and another thing is that I wanted an A but it was really hard for me to earn an A 
in on my report card and that just meant a lot to me and I know I had a question in the group uh, last week about do grades uh, affect your kids do they matter to your kids they do matter um, they want to make that top grade and when they don't make that top grade then their self-esteem goes down my sister was smart smarter than I was she made all the A's I never begrudged her with that I was like that's great and she never <laughs> rubbed it in my nose I made a B I was the B and the C, the B and the C student. She was the A person in the, in, the, in the family, which was fine, right? We got along just fine. But I still inside of me thought, what is wrong with me? Why am I not enough? Why can I make that A? Have you ever felt that way? Why, what is going on? And so when I think about that for myself and how those feelings that I had, that I didn't feel like I was enough. I couldn't live up to what others were others were performing at but then again I didn't know their struggles and I was only going against my own expectations for myself not and no one else was putting the expectation on me my parents did not expect that from me they never said Jean you need to make an A they never said that to me and so but it was something that I took inside internally it's like man I can't make an A I'm gonna make a B I'm gonna make a C you know and this continued all the way up through college and so it was just like okay that's who I am and and I'm great in other areas as well and and so this is just the way it is so when it came time to um, decide on a profession I went into teaching to education first I started college as an edu as a music major I loved piano, the, playing the piano I thought I was good at it but I really did not like it <laughs> at all when um, when I when I got into got into that major, I said I told my mom I said if you want me to continue to love music, I need to leave being a music major, and I went into education, and so um, I thought well okay great why am I in education i you know well it was elementary education and the first day of that sophomore year the uh, administrator came in and asked if anybody was interested in a certification in learning disabilities my hand went like this and I said well I guess it was me I think I'm interested because obviously what my brain was telling me was that I struggle maybe I need to figure out myself as well as help other kids because I understand and understood how other kids are struggling le uh, learners would feel right or feeling and how, how I could help them so I said okay that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna go into special education with the elementary ed background in special education and putting all those together I loved my special education courses because I could I could relate to what was going on in those in the um, material that we were studying? I'm like, I can relate to this. I get it. This is this is where we struggle. And so at that point, dyslexia was still being played around with the terminology. Of course, they did not use dyslexia in the schools, and they still don't now because they think of it as a medical term. But it's the same thing. They call it learning disability, and I really would rather not be called disabled. But using the word dyslexia basically it's the same thing it's just the medical terminology and many schools will not use that term because it is a medical term it is not an education term so um anyway that that was really interesting so i taught for uh five years and in a resource room and i had kids come to me and they were struggling and i helped them and we worked hard and i loved my students then i took time off and i did a master's degree came back to the school system, worked another five years at a couple of different other schools, and I decided that, that, that this, this, I just needed to go find something else. And I needed something else, something else that was um, more in-depth as to what was going on in the brain, right? And so I left, and I ended up uh, working for a neurologist who had a private clinic. And she was amazing. This is back in the like 1990s, where early 1990s, where um, the brain work and the functional MRIs became available that we could study them. And she was able to get permission to uh, have several people that she knew who were dyslexic to, to do the, M the functional MRIs. So that was just amazing to see all of 
you know, the difference between the dyslexic brain and a non-dyslexic brain. There is truly a difference between the brains. And at the time, we did not know about neuroplasticity and how the brain can change. We do now know that 30 years later, that in the scientific, in the scientific world is talking about you can change your brain. You can change your thoughts. You can change the wiring in your brain. So one of the things that we did in the clinic was um, worked on different ways that different pathways that we could utilize and we could build for reading success. And so we, we searched and we found a great program that would work really well that would help to, um, the students who had um, reading issues or reading disabilities to be able to learn to read. And we were able to create new neural pathways. And because the brain was different, we realized that way the schools were teaching was not helping and not getting into the brain system where, where it needed to be in order to help kids to learn how to read. So with this new knowledge and started to, um, you know, started to, um, there's notifications flashing on my screen and so it's distracting me right now. Okay, so anyway, um, this new new information on how we could create new neural pathways and we developed this reading program that would work and that would help these kids. In doing so, one of the things was uh, taking a look at what the strength is in the brain for people who have dyslexia. It's their visual field in their brains. They are big visual. They want they need to see the big visual picture visualization of what's going on in their reading. And that was one of the skills that we taught was visualizing what they read and putting this big picture together so that they could draw the answers from their big picture in order to understand what the story was about or what the what the um, geography lesson was about or the social studies lesson or whatever. But we, it, we, we went through it painstakingly, little bit by little bit by little bit and trained how to visualize. It was amazing. And it was called visualizing and verbalizing. So able to see the big picture in the brain as well as to talk about what we saw and verbalize it. That was a big hook. I trained that, I learned how to do that. And it was great because that went, that's where my aha came on how I could help myself when I do, when I'm reading a book or reading something else that I can put together this big picture of and hook this information on this picture in my brain. And so I was like, oh my goodness, this is the key. This is awesome because it's utilizing the strength of the brain for a dyslexic brain, okay? And so, and also, you know, ADHD brain and some of the, some of the other brains as well that are different. They're not, they're not, there's nothing wrong with them. They are amazing brains, okay? Creativity is huge. And whenever something can be told in story format, it is, it's like a, a game changer. So if there's any way that you can take the information that your child is learning and turn it into a story, you know, then they're going to remember that so much better as, and they're going to be able to visualize that and to really understand, you know, what's going on. You can, uh, we, with our technology that we have now, you can Google stories about different things, stories about the Eiffel Tower, stories about the, the Statue of Liberty, stories about, you know, whatever. And so it can be created into a story format, which is very, very useful for our kids who struggle with learning because they have a huge visual, visual feel that they can they can actually create like the whole gestalt of what is, you know, being taught or learned. Okay. So that was an aha for me. And that was one of the things that I wanted to bring forward. Right. And I taught a few more years and then I left and, and I uh, had my family and now I'm back and I want, like, would like to pass this information and to help, um, our future people. So like one of the things we said is that, you know, what, I mean, one of my title, and this is going to be the title for the whole uh, series of lives that I'm going to, be, going to be doing over the next few months, is what needs to shift for the next school year. I don't know about you, but summer is great because it's a release from the routine and we get to do something different from the school year. And with COVID now, just kind of, we understand it a lot better and how to keep ourselves safe, that we can still be out and go out and enjoy, right? But it's also a time of, of releasing that tension, but also looking forward. All right. So, you know, generally I'm great until about July 4th weekend, which is coming up. 
And as a teacher, July 4th weekend marked my halfway mark between my summer before I had to go back to work. And so right after July 4th, I would start pulling out my paper and my pen and I start doing my planning for the next school year. So for me, that, you know, I would, I would try not to think about anything, but then I'd start thinking and looking forward of what can the next school year, how could that be different for my students? for you know for your kids so if you are wanting to make that change like something has got to change because my child is not motivated to want to learn or to pick up that book we're going to be talking about different things that can be going on with our kids in their thinking in our thinking you know as parents and how all that can actually make a difference one of the things that you know the first thing that comes out especially from teachers how can I help my child or even as parents because we run on old stories or old messages of when we were in school and it's like to get better at something you do skill and drill skill and drill skill and drill and you do it until you know you're so tired of it, so sick and tired of it until finally you're gonna to get to be able to know how to spell that word or know how to work that math problem or know how to read this story or this book but the thing is when you stop and think about it do you want to skill and drill on something that already gives you pain and agony in learning it? It's like, it's just like, you know, doing something more of like, like I had an example here, um, doing something more and more and more, something that you really don't like doing, okay? For instance, like skating or like ice skating. If you're not a really good ice skater and say well just get out and just skate some more and just skate some more and keep practicing you keep falling down and, and no one is giving you any any uh, boundaries or railings that you can hold on to it's going to be more difficult example also is um you know read for 20 minutes every night um and either you know with your child or your child reads themselves well if the child is struggling with reading to begin with 20 minutes a night with reading is agony because they've not given, been given tools in order to figure out like how to read, how, what's the best way that they're gonna read, that they can read. And uh, even, you know, there are, there are some kids that can remediate and there are some things that, that can help them, but they're slow and they're very, it's very tedious and it's very hard. And so some of the parents have come into the group said, how can I motivate my kid to pick up a book to read? Well, if the child is struggling in reading, why would they want to do more of the same hard thing okay so looking at things differently making those shifts what is something another way that we can come at this that's going to be a lot more motivating and a lot more useful for the child so those are some of the things we're going to tackle we're going to take a look at and um so if you want to go deeper with that we will hop on a call with me 15 minute call you can do that i'll put a link down below this uh, video and you can click that if you want to so you know let me know one of the things about facebook algorithms is and especially being inside the group this live is not going to be shown a whole lot but what I would love, love, love for you to do, that if you're watching this video on replay, put hashtag replay, put it in the comments. Anything you can put in the comments will boost the video in the news feed so that more people can see it. And it's that, so, you know, you can do likes, you can do, um, uh, what's it, likes and love and care or something like that any of those type of emojis and then also just write replay or if you have a question or a comment uh, below in the comments that would be awesome because what happens is the way the algorithms are it goes in the in the Facebook feed and that's where a lot of times you all see the videos or see whatever I'm posting is in the feed and you may not necessarily be in the group so in order for everyone we have over a thousand 500 people in this group and I would love for everyone to be able to have a chance to see the um, the videos and the the, co the questions that you all are asking and the information that we're talking about so anytime that you can make a comment or a you know just something an emoji or something uh, that's going to help push those posts into the feed a little bit more just kind of give you a little update on that algorithm thing. So if you could help that out, that would really be awesome. And if you do want to go deeper on a call, um, put, uh, I will click, click the link that's below in the comments. Okay, so I will see y'all on Thursday. Bye.